Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the Executive Director of the Ohio Chapter of APA and Chair of the New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today, Wednesday, September 7th, we will be hearing the presentation, Citizen Ingenuity and Impact Assessment. For technical help during today's webcast, Type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call the 1-800 number shown in bold. And for your content questions related to the presentation, you can type those in the chat box, also located, in the, again, in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. And uh, I'd like to remind everyone to please indicate which panelist you would like to answer the question when you're typing those questions in. Coming up on your screen is a list of the sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2016. Thank you to all the participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to their members. Today's webcast, in particular, is sponsored by the Planning and the Black Community Division. To learn more about this division, just head over to planning.org slash divisions slash black community. Next on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. To register for our webcasts, just visit our webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. You will note that uh, coming up, there are three webcasts that are reserved by a particular division or chapter, uh, but they have not been inputted yet for CM credit. So please be sure to check back on our webpage for more up-to-date information uh, coming soon for those webcasts. But we just wanted to let everyone know we do have webcasts reserved for those dates. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, just head to planning.org and log into your account. And then you can search for CM activities up at the top of the page and uh, either uh, type in the event number for today's webcast or the title of today's webcast both of which, again, can be found on our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And this webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. We do have some recorded webcasts that are available for distance education. Just head to ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast, again, our webcast webpage. Uh, to learn more about the distance education sessions that we have available for you. Like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on our webcasts. And we are recording today's webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash planningwebcast. And we will have a PDF of the presentation available at the conclusion of the session on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. All right, I am now going to get this ball rolling by turning it over to Carlton Ely to introduce today's topic and get us started. Carlton, it's headed over to you. Thank you, Christine. Also, I want to thank the uh, members of our audience for taking the time to join us today. EPA's Office of Environmental Justice is pleased to partner with the Planning and the Black Community Division of the American Planning Association on this webinar series. For 36 years, the division has been committed to the professional development of its members, making great communities happen, as well as elevating important policy issues including environmental justice. Educational opportunities like this webinar represent one means for connecting with the public 
and we're looking forward to having practitioners share their knowledge about important topics in, com in coming months. Today's webinar is the second in a three-part series on equitable development. We created this series for the purpose of elevating solutions that should be part of the dialogue for making communities sustainable and resilient. When EPA launched this series a couple of years ago, it gave us a new opportunity to acquaint the public with a very impressive narrative of environmental justice and problem solving. Thanks to the tireless efforts of researchers and advocates, the creative thinking of planners and architects, and the compelling results of determined community builders, the public is finding new ways to align environmental justice and planning as complementary quality of life goals. The focus of today's webinar is citizen ingenuity and impact assessment. The objective is to explore how citizens and experts are leveraging the use of impact assessments so that informed decisions are made within cities and regions. The National Environmental Policy Act has been an important cornerstone for environmental policy for 46 years. It was written broadly and with the understanding that all things are connected. Specifically, social and cultural impacts are not institutionally separate from environmental impacts. Although there are provisions, regulations for implementation, and principles and guidelines, the integrated use of social science and assessing impacts has often left a lot to be desired. And in some cases, it has become a perfunctory exercise. Today's webinar will focus on how citizens are exercising leadership to fill long-standing gaps. Our discussants have distinguished themselves by boldly conducting assessments that are social and cultural in their orientation. In the process, they are mitigating impacts that would hinder sustainable outcomes Equally important, they are creating the space for dialogue in order to more effectively manage blind spots. Today we are joined by three experts whose accomplishments are quite remarkable. What I personally admire is their demonstration that citizens don't have to be spectators when prevailing methods of impact assessment fail to adequately acknowledge issues that are considered important. We always have the option to initiate an independent assessment. The Office of Environmental Justice and the Planning in the Black Community Division of the American Planning Association appreciate their willingness to be with us and offer remarks today. Our presenters are Chancey Martorell, Tracy Strum Gilliam, and Michael Allen. The presenters will wrap up their remarks by 2 o'clock approximately, and then we will transition into the question and answer portion of our webinar, which will be led by Christine Dursey. Chancey Martorell is our first presenter. Uh, Chancey is the executive director of the Thai Community Development Center, a nonprofit organization she founded in 1994 in an effort to improve the lives of Thai immigrants through services that promote cultural adjustment and economic self-sufficiency. She documented the demographic and social and human needs of Thais in Los Angeles in a landmark community needs assessment study as a way to advocate for more resources in underserved communities. Chancey is an urban planner and she is a leading practitioner in the field of community development. Chancey, thank you for joining us today. And Chancey, you may need to unmute yourself. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I thought I had it down. Um, so welcome, everyone, to this webinar. Thank you, Carlton, for inviting me back to present on this uh, topic, uh, Citizen Ingenuity and Impact Assessment. I'm very pleased to be able to uh, present again. Uh, I will start out with the citizen ingenuity part. In fact, <clears throat> it's great that uh, Carlton had um, <clears throat> brought this topic up because it does uh, require a spark of some kind to um, lead 
to an understanding of the community's uh, issues and needs and, and really be able to move forward with um, really the kind of uh, action-based uh, policies and, um, and, and practices that we want to, to see to mitigate some of these negative impacts in our community. And so I will begin first with that spark. And the spark that had occurred uh, here in Los Angeles, where I am from, uh, occurred in 1992. At the time, I was a graduate student at UCLA Urban Planning. And um, that uh, spark uh, that occurred in 92 was the Los Angeles Civil Unrest, uh, which folks also know as the LA riots. Uh, we uh, tend to consider it a civil unrest or social unrest because it really was a manifestation of a history of social and economic inequities that uh, were just um, uh, pre prevalent in poor minority communities in Los Angeles. And um, what I had come to call a brutalification of Los Angeles, where we had the polarization between the half and half not, uh, the more uh, wealthy, affluent, uh, non-minority communities versus the poor minority communities, uh, predominantly in uh, inner city LA. Now, unfortunately, sadly, the, um, the civil unrest um, was not just a manifestation of the history of neglect and lack of economic development and lack of investment, but also was compounded by police brutality. And, um, and, and uh, in, in it, it, it resulted in, of course, that civil unrest. Now, in the aftermath of this, we had a massive rebuilding effort. And a lot of funding was coming down the pipeline, a lot of resources from federal sources, from um, the, the corporate uh, entities, and, uh, and, and also from um, California and local uh, city of LA sources. And in this rebuilding process, of course, um, Sadly, there were some communities that were overlooked that had, that had been adversely impacted by the civil unrest, uh, who, whose um, stores and businesses were also damaged and, and looted in the process. <clears throat> and that included the Thai community. The Thai community um, is a, a community that goes back 60 years here in the United States. And uh, the largest community abroad is, is here in Southern California. Half of that is in Los Angeles County with pockets in, in various uh, parts of the county. Uh, unfortunately, at that point in time, in 1992, we continue to, to be um, uh, just confronted with this invisibility factor. And, and as a result, we did not receive a lot of the resources and funding that we needed also to to engage in the rebuilding process. And so what that led to, uh, that spark led to then this, what Carlton has called form of citizen in ingenuity. And that was, well, in that case, if we needed to access some of these resources, what will it take for us to make it clear and known to the powers that be uh, that, that here we are, we had had this devastating uh, impact on our community, and uh, our needs are growing unmet. We need also to be rendered uh, resettlement assistance and emergency relief. So um, just putting on my planning uh, thinking cap, I decided, well, there's never been a needs assessment created to document the existence of the Thai community uh, at all. Uh, so. We then, and I then, embarked on the first needs assessment survey of the Thai community. Because what we need is an advocacy tool. And this needs assessment would help uh, identify and document the community demographics, the welfare and human service needs of the community, their social and economic characteristics. And then once we document and identified all of that data, we would then be able to use it as an advocacy tool to, to demand uh, some attention and, and resources, and in the process, raise our community's visibility and let folks know that we exist, we, we're here, we have a presence. Now, we collected over 600 surveys in that process. I trained a group of Thai-American 
students in data collection and in um, developing survey instruments. And we realized that in order to really raise the visibility of the Thai community and help the Thai community uh, achieve um, some, um, some, some sense that <laughs> it is, is being um, really taken care of and, and thought of uh, and, um, and really uh, just um, avoiding the continuing marginalization of the Thai community, we essentially incorporate into this survey perhaps the need to designate a section of Los Angeles known as East Hollywood as Thai Town. And this would not only just raise our community's visibility and overcome that invisibility factor and, and marginalization, but also a way to use cultural tourism as a vehicle for, for economic development. Because sadly, that area of East Hollywood has suffered neglect and blight and urban decay and, and uh, history of disinvestment and lack of capital infusion. And yet, it's a growing, thriving uh, ethnic enclave that is actually multi-ethnic, multicultural. You have their ties living and working alongside Armenians and Latinos. And so as a result, our surveys results had shown overwhelming support for such a, a creation of an enclave to be not just only a commercial center, but a cultural and community center as well. And it would be ideally located in the eastern section of Hollywood, which actually has served as the historic port of entry for newly arrived, arrived Thai immigrants going back 60 years. And um, in, in this uh, vein, using Thai Town as a community economic development strategy, so this is where the impact assessment piece comes in. So one of the outcomes of that citizen ingenuity um, resulted in not just this landmark needs assessment to document all of the needs of, of a community suffering from neglect and, and disability and marginalization, but also led to now the creation of an, uh, an area at, known as now Thai Town in East Hollywood, but also a community economic development strategy based on cultural tourism. So this was really an opportunity for people to take charge of the development process more fully, since local residents really bear the burden of what happens in their community, there should be the prevailing voice. It's just a matter of simple justice. So we did a lot of education um, through focus groups and visioning exercises and charrettes. This is really the mechanisms through which empowerment is fostered. And um, overall, the creation of Thai Town and, and utilizing this as an economic development strategy would improve the financial well-being of an otherwise economically disadvantaged population would emphasize exchange and equity, improve the social strength of the community as well, will nourish the households and neighborhoods, and also really um, make it clear that entrepreneurship plays a crucial role in the sustenance uh, and vitality of Thai Town if you want to use cultural tourism. And, and fortunately, our uh, Thai Community Development Center that also got started as a result of the needs assessment um, has this social uh, entrepreneurship program and also a small business program that promotes entrepreneurship. And, um, and so the community got mobilized and convened several meetings and, uh, and town halls and formed this Thai Town Formation Committee that was a broad representation of all sectors of the community, including workers, youth, seniors, uh, business owners, and, and, um, and workers. And, uh, and so the net result, the impact, really resulted in this designation campaign that began in 92 that uh, also finally established uh, the, the Thai Community Development Center in 1994 because the findings helped inform our program design and the programs and projects that were essential to meet the needs of that, of that growing uh, community that's growing with unmet needs. Preserving our cultural integrity uh, was also one of the end results. It enhances ethnically diverse area. It placed a greater demand on the policy and local institutions of, 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 of our um, city and uh, encouraged Thai immigrants to interact with a greater community. So here we are as Thais asking for concessions, not as Thais in Thailand, but as Thai Americans residing in LA. 
and trying to advance our social and material goals, and also doing so as a united entity. It was truly an active assertion of our community's consciousness and declaring that we exist, we occupy a space, that we identify ourselves as a community associated with a place in history, and it's engaging the community in the building, community building process, counting our community as just um, not just as another part of the rich tapestry, but really a united entity that can come to consensus. So this is really an example of what we call community-based participatory research, CBPR. Um, you could also find um, uh, a, um, a study of this in um, the, um, the, the, the book that was published recently by the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and the Urban Institute, What Counts and How to Harness Data for America's Communities. So, um, so what we engaged in was a form of street science. We were democratizing the collection and use of data, and in the process, increasing active citizenship and local leadership. And, um, and why would I propose a community-based participatory research? And, um, and why we're here today to, to, to propose this is because this is really the method by which you will conduct research with the community, not on the community, and where you're engaged in the community. Because after all, they have the sophisticated insider knowledge and understanding of their community. So we should respect their community wisdom. <clears throat> the findings have proven to be through this process of CBPR also to be more relevant, more rigorous, and, and deeper in terms of its reach. And um, it's more culturally sensitive, especially in low-income communities of color, and allows us as researchers to ask the right questions because we're always engaging the community. It enhances our data and really identifies new channels for us to disseminate the data as well, and also helps build the community and, in, and, and individual uh, capacity, providing the community more uh, of the ability to study and address all these other issues that may concern them, and um, increases critical thinking and collective problem solving um, and engagement, community engagement again. Traditional research that some of us may also be used to uh, tend to be uh, limited and have limitations because they tend to they tend to be outside expert driven and. And there is long-standing distrust in the community of outside researchers because they're just dropping in, collecting data, then they disappear, leave nothing behind, what we call parachute research. Um, and, and there are very core principles that uh, CBTR uh, actually follow. And, um, and these are some of the principles that you see on the screen here. We uh, try to um, really abide by the principle of, of uh, collaboration with those affected and um, using our, our findings for a purpose of taking action and affecting change, not just education, and really recognizing commu the community and emphasizing their strengths and um, making sure the research topic is really important to the community, that, that community members are engaged throughout the whole process of the research. And, and that it's, it's balanced. And most importantly, it's uh, intentional in terms of explicitly including all genders, races, class, and, and cultures, and, and the sort of humility uh, involved here to uh, address to all of these um, sometimes unintentional biases of researchers. And, um, and addresses power dynamics as well. And, um, when you engage with the community, it's really an authentic partnership. Now, the methodology of doing this type of uh, participatory research requires that you recruit and train members of the community, which is what we did when we embarked on our needs assessment of the Thai community, which was a landmark needs assessment. And uh, it requires really continuing uh, engagement of the community as well in the whole process throughout the process of not just collecting the data, but interpreting the data, and then determining how we can use the data as, like I mentioned before, an advocacy tool, and also an, uh, a data-based action for change. Uh, after all, community really knows what the conditions are in their community and what methods are most acceptable and useful and culturally appropriate for their community. So there are pros and cons of community engagement. Um, 
obviously a lot are on the pro side of community engagement. If you don't engage the community, you're going to find yourself seeing that the participant participation rate is lower, and there's the um, the, the the question of, of whether the data, data is valuable. And also, it may reinforce a lack of culture and social familiarity of, of the researchers, um, reflects uh, little of the local customs and beliefs, and it could scale your <laughs> any data-driven interventions, um, and then reinforces the community distrust. So on the pro side, you could see a lot of pros there. Um, and I mentioned it earlier. I'm not going to mention it for the sake of time. And um, the next slide, let's see. I'm not able to advance my next slide. Oh, here it is. OK, ground truthing. <laughs> I'm sorry. OK, so it is a form of ground truthing, what you are engaged in through this uh, community-based participatory research. and. Um, it really improves your data. It uh, helps the the community um, really check the validity validity of your uh, of your data sets, and um, it's really using communities observations on the ground. And um, there are many challenges, mind you. Our needs assessment survey um, was was conducted uh, back in '92, and um, I, of course, encountered a lot of challenges. It's time consuming, it's messy, it's very labor intensive. Um, it's challenging when you're dealing with marginalized groups because uh, they have limited command of, of uh, understanding uh, this, this kind of data and uh, maybe limited command of their um, dominant language uh, and, and uh, limited English proficiency. And then they have very severe time and income constraints. Uh, they also may be inaccessible. They have long work hours. They lack child care. Um, and then there's translation costs and what have you. So um, I'm going to move on here. So Thai CDC's research was, was an example of, of it being community-based because it recruited and trained members in the community. And um, it met with the community to present its findings. It organized a campaign around it, and it uh, led to Thai Town Formation Committee that spearheaded the designation of Thai Town. It also led to Thai CC's uh, founding, and um, and um, continues to this day to serve as an advocacy tool because, for the first time, we were educating policymakers that we exist. Uh, it got word out to all the organizations, policymakers, and funders uh, that we are in need of additional resources. And it jump-started a data-driven community organizing and advocacy campaign to affect change that resulted in the 1999 designation of Thai Town and um, essentially the creation of Thai CDC in 1994. Now, how we okay, continue please. to measure? Yes. Just want to acknowledge you have three minutes. Okay, perfect. Because I'm I'm going now through the last slide slides. Thank you for telling me that the success of Thai Town obviously continues to be measured uh, just constantly, and and how we measure that would be how well it contributes to the overall development process and how well it satisfies basic rights for jobs and economic security, decent affordable housing, and as a result of the the uh, needs assessment, we have now been able to reap some of these outcomes, leverage more research on Thai Town, improve the infrastructure and amenities of East Hollywood, the area that suffered so much blight and urban decay, uh, and actually um, uh, did a streetscaping uh, project, improved the services in the area promoted neighborhood pride, multicultural exchanges, and cultural tourism, like our annual Thai Town Festival, Thai Culture Day, Thai New Year's Day Festival. Uh, we promote now more beautification and greening of Thai Town, making it a really sustainable uh, Thai Town and uh, utilizing sustainable cultural tourism, and um, like the gateway and the pedestrian um, lamppost, and promoting more civic engagement promoting unity among diverse ethnic groups as we come together around um, really um, the importance of cultural tourism and 
and uh, how it could play a role in driving a local economy and developing our um, economies in, in the various uh, enclaves throughout Los Angeles and, and the Asian community. Um, enclaves have gotten together and promoted um, each other's communities through this Preserve America Neighborhood Coalition where we got in 2008 the designation by the White House as a Preserve American Neighborhood. So we do a lot of cross-marketing and cultural heritage marketing. Um, and this also has improved the health and well-being of the community. We now have our weekly farmers market and create, and we will be creating uh, further economic opportunities uh, with our Titan Marketplace, which starts construction actually in two weeks. and. Um, it will be a business incubator that will create 18 microenterprises and 40 jobs. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. And I'll be around at the end to obviously answer any question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chancy. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, revisiting and, and asking you more questions during the Q&A. And Chancy is now going to switch uh, the controls over to uh, Tracy, who is our second presenter. Uh, her name is Tracy Strom Gilliam. Uh, Tracy is a director at PRR, and she leads the firm's Baltimore office. Tracy built her 20-year career with a foundation in environmental and transportation planning. She is a national expert in the area of environmental justice, analysis, and outreach. In addition to her technical expertise in the fields of community impact assessment and public involvement, Tracy has established a reputation as an effective manager of grassroots outreach programs and consensus building. Tracy is a member of several committees for the Transportation Research Board, including the Committee on Environmental Justice and Transportation, the Committee on Social and Economic Factors of Transportation, and the Committee on Community Impact Assessment. Tracy, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Carlton. So um, Chancy was able to give an overview of what she's been able to do in the LA area and focus um, primarily on research and integration. And what I'm going to talk to you about is the nexus between community impact assessments and environmental justice analysis. Um, those of you that are on the, um, the call today may have exposure to one or the other, but may not understand how to incorporate both together um, to really provide a holistic experience experience as a practitioner. So quickly, what is a community impact assessment? Well, as you, most of you may know, it's an interactive process to evaluate the effects of a transportation act, action on a community and its quality of life. Not just community cohesion, not just focusing on um, property impacts, but really how everything plays into, um, into one specific picture for a project and then the, com the compendium parts of that project that are long lasting after the project is open and operational and the local DOT has moved on. Um, but there are some elements, of basic elements of community impact assessment that all of you may not know of and that is that the typically community impact assessments are conducted outside of NEPA. They can be done under the NEPA process as well, but it's a really a great screening tool, um, and you can use it when you're prior to construction or when you're um, before you even do a feasibility study, or for smaller projects that do not require a NEPA analysis. It does incorporate a review of um, EJ populations and some reporting um, on EJ elements, but it does not conduct a full environmental justice analysis. And the typical community impact assessment areas include uh, determining social impacts, economic impacts, and land use and growth effects, as well as some public service impacts or com components. And that could be um, fire access, um, access to schools, whether or not you're impacting um, any specific community facility or other type of service um, as well. And so from the environmental justice perspective, um, for those of you that may not be familiar with that, really environmental justice is a fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, um, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, um, with respect to the development and implementation and enforcement of laws and regulations. From the transportation sphere, primarily what we're looking at is does a Project X 
uh, disproportionately impact low-income and minority populations, and what are the benefits of burdens upon those populations as a result of the uh, operation and main, main maintenance of a specific project or policy. And um, the roots of environmental justice are grounded in Title VI as well as many of the components of CIA as well, just really protecting people and making sure that our products are equitable and fair for the most part. Um, the executive order um, that gives breath and life to environmental justice as a practice uh, was signed by President Clinton in 1994. And so uh, EPA just celebrated the, the 20 year anniversary and um, not long ago. And the focus primarily is to make sure that we're addressing and identifying disproportionately high and adverse human health and environmental impacts on minority and low-income populations. Again, CIA, while it's relative to all populations, still those components um, are, you know, can be shared in the in environmental justice spectrum. Um, one of the, the tenets of EJ um, is, again, identifying uh, social and economic effects, which ties right and directly to the tenets of CIA. Um, also, the com a large component is public involvement and engagement, really getting out there in the community, de defining what a community is. In the CIA spectrum, you're going beyond just a block. You're coordinating with local residents and stakeholders and uh, political officials to figure out what that community really compromises. It, um, whether it, you know, you may be looking at the project as a block or two, but based upon history, that community could extend another three or four blocks. Um, so you got to go beyond the mapping and really kind of get in there and get involved and engaged. From the EJ perspective, you may only be looking at where certain populations are and um, whether they're minority or low income. And again, still identifying what community is for those folks and um, whether or not you're looking at migrant workers, et cetera. So the components of the EJ analysis, um, which is typically uh, conducted under NEPA process for transportation projects specifically, and it shares some related assessments, of course, of demographic profile, which is both completed under CIA and under the EJ analysis, and of course, portions of the impact analysis. And so some of the shared categories, um, it's interesting to look at, the, the naming convention is just a little different. Of course, social impacts, economic impacts, land use and growth. Um, CIA, their public service impacts, and under uh, EJ, the NEPA component, they're really neighborhood community facilities, um, going down that whole um, human environment perspective. Then looking at the environmental impact of a project and those specific burdens, and then um, conducting a benefits and burdens analysis, and then of course resulting in a final disproportionate impact determination um, that is utilized uh, for future mitigation and, and work um, as the project progresses. Um, some of the guidance documents that are important to note, um, FHWA of course has the set of purple books. Uh, community Impact Assessment, and that document came out in 1996 and actually is being updated by the TRB subcommittee on um, Community Impact Assessment right now. Um, there may be local guidance documents. There's huge CIA work that has been undertaken um, by Florida DOT, New Jersey DOT, um, California DOT or Caltrans. Um, there's been work in North Carolina. So there are are DOTs that are really pushing um, the CIA component, and you can utilize any of those specific references to better your impact analysis or view. Also, from the EJ perspective, um, you want to make sure that you're uh, re following uh, CEQ guidance and, of course, uh, US DOT guidance. And if it happens to be a project that has FTA monies, you want to be following the Title VI and EJ circulars that came out in 2012. And EPA also has um, some EJ guidances as well. So uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, but the, the real tie that binds these two practices that uh, uh, together is really grounded in um, transparent 
early and detailed public outreach and engagement. Uh, that work, um, as Chauncey noted before, is so important to um, learning about specific community concerns and needs, um, determining what local facilities or factors are important to a community. And one of the things that we also recognize in these processes is that it's important to identify who the advocates are and what your additional resources may be. Uh, whether you're working from the spectrum of an environmental document um, and you have a design team member that's focused on design and uh, context systems of design or minimizing the cost of that design, it's important to understand that the human element and perspective is also important. And the resulting work of the CIA um, EJ analysis and any public outreach can help inform those design decisions. Remember, the EJ uh, tenants are to minimize and avoid and um, the, the impacts to folks. And CIA also captures some of that as well. What you're documenting impacts in that process, you're also helping to inform potential mitigation measures as well. And those are important for protecting communities. The other aspect is that public outreach engagement helps to build coalitions and captures diverse opinions and views. And not only that, but they also further to illustrate um, an agency or department or your own personal commitment to transparency and putting residents and stakeholders first and not specifically the project. Um, you know, from the aspect of uh, awareness and engagement, and this goes to the self-advocacy and, and this notion that even oftentimes in the middle of a process, citizens themselves um, have a role to play in advocating for a certain position or advocating for their needs. Absent of a NEPA process or a specific project, communities now are banding together to determine what their, their needs are or what may be missing or what can enhance their community or environment. And that process really informs project decision making, um, improving the understanding of citizens and stakeholders. One of the things we hear a lot about is consensus building. Um, I like to say that there's consensus building and then there's broadening horizons and understanding. And, and so this really seeks to do that too because um, while you may not get everyone to agree about a particular issue or initiative, giving folks the power to enhance or change their condition is always important. And it helps them to understand the specific elements and projects that build a collective unit or region or community or vision. Um, the engagement also uh, results in long-term partnering commitments and, and encourages uh, thoughtful and more detailed conversation. So Carlton asked for me to talk about a project where we were in a NEPA process and we also had a component of CIA and, and some self-advocacy from local residents. And the project that I chose to highlight was the Baltimore Red Line. Now I'll say up front that that project has ended. There was a gubernatorial election and the new governor of Maryland decided to end that project in July of 2015. However, the work that was done as a part of that seven to ten year effort really highlights what citizen awareness and stakeholder engagement and um, detailed analysis can do towards moving communities forward. Just a little bit about the project. Uh, it was an east-west corridor. Um, the, re the corridor itself was highly minority, upwards of 82% minority. Um, the area had legacy issues um, as a result of the infamous highway to nowhere. But the project was really put together um, with the thought process of improving transit and relieving congestion and also supporting economic development throughout the corridor and really moving those areas of poverty um, and disinvestment um, forward um, through the connection of transportation to educational components, um, culture, lifestyle, jobs, et cetera. 
Um, this is a quick view of the alignment so you could see um, how it would, the project was intended to tra traverse the city and like I said before with highly minority and low income. So uh, the approach that was taken for this specific project was to have a blended uh, CIA and EJ analysis. While there wasn't a specific CIA technical report that was written, there was a socioeconomic technical report that was written and also uh, a detailed environmental justice analysis. Remember, going back again to where these specific uh, analysis areas whether they are using the same terms or not are all interrelated and the impact analysis itself is what we need to make sure that we're addressing the needs of specific communities, developing um, mitigation and minimization plans and also analyzing those benefits and burdens. From the community awareness and advocacy perspective, uh, it was the a lot of um, folks in the neighborhoods that uh, sought for um, MTA, which is the Maryland um, Transit Administration, and for the city of Baltimore to develop a community compact. And what those neighborhoods were saying is that if this project is going to come through our neighborhoods, we need to benefit from the project being here, and how can we best be involved and engage and protect ourselves and making sure that we have access to jobs and enhanced transportation services. The other part of that um, captured the public involvement piece, which was MTA um, utilized community liaisons and advisory committees to make sure that representatives from the community had a voice and someone who to coordinate with um, on a daily basis. And the neighborhood needs assessment was um, conducted as a part of a station area advisory committee process. And um, so the compact itself, um, again, addressed jobs, um, environmental sustainability, that station area planning that I talked about, and then talking about minimizing impacts and setting a path forward through for construction. The compact was signed by uh, elected officials and all of the appropriate agencies and community members that were all uh, tied together to make sure um, that the focus was on making the red line communities better and stronger and more sustainable. And those station area advisory committees included about 17 over the 20 stations that were um, suggested at the time and plan, and the scope of work included uh, visioning exercises, um, identifying priorities and some urban design components and a public art program, but more importantly, the work resulted in a community needs assessment that was undertaken by each individual SAC. And those staff were charged with looking at their communities and what was missing. And while this was a transportation project, we knew um, and MTA understood that the resulting community um, assessment, the information coming from there could be used in Baltimore City's traditional planning process. Uh, to better communities, and that needs assessment um, concluded that there was a need for grocery stores and retail, um, health services and elder care, more affordable housing options, that there was a lack of daycare centers and play community areas in many of the neighborhoods um, where stations were planned, um, that there were community spaces that were needed, in addition to uh, transportation improvements that the project was serving to uh, work for. And also um, that lighting, enhanced lighting would be a benefit. And the biggest realization was that residents figured out that fighting every project that came along may not be for their full benefit, but that they needed to look at it from a lens of identifying protection zones and projects that, of course, they would not go along with, but that they would turn their lens to focus on finding investment partners and how to really move the needle in communities. One of the benefits um, that I can speak to specifically that came out of this process 
is the fact that Baltimore City DOT did, um, as a result of some of the recommendations that came out of this, um, did a safety lighting program in many of these neighborhoods. So there has been an enhanced LED lighting to help reduce crime. Um, there have uh, been neighborhood walks that many of the communities now have ambassador programs. And, um, and that's also a benefit of those collective community conversations. So what were the results of having this blended experience? Well, one, we were able to create a comprehensive methodology. Remember, the methodologies for given projects should be tailored to the project. They should not be cookie-cutter methodologies that are pulled from another, a different project and applied to each one. So we were able to make sure that we could address the CIA needs and the EJ needs and this public involvement spectrum together. EPA was very happy with the, consult the resulting uh, EIS that was prepared, and um, accolades came in saying that the EJ analysis was thorough and full, as well as the, the full uh, public involvement program, that it went beyond the status quo in terms of providing opportunities for engagement. Um, again, talking about the results of that SAC process, that self-assessment of the citizens that work with the SAC coordinators and facilitators, and the results of that are still informing um, the planning process here in Baltimore City. All of that resulting information was turned over to the sector planners um, and community planners, um, as well as some of the nonprofits in the area so they could take on independent projects. Um, it helped us build stronger relationships. Again, at the start of this particular piece of this being an example, I talked about how this project ended. Well, it ended, but it's been reinvented in another way. Um, MTA has now taken the Baltimore Link up um, as a comprehensive process to help improve transportation in the city via bus transit. And the relationships that were built in this corridor as a part of the red line um, were able to be utilized and tapped into for the expansion of that particular study and for other work that is going on. Um, and again, the result is always better planning because we want better communities. And Carlton, I'm going to now send it over to Michael. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, Michael Allen is our final presenter today. I'm very pleased Michael joined us because the National Park Service is celebrating its centennial this year. Uh, Michael Allen began his uh, public career with the National Park Service in 1980. He has served as a park ranger and is now the community partnership specialist for Fort Sumter National Monument and the Charles Pinckney National Historic Site. He played a major role in the National Park Service's Gullah Geechee Special Resource Study as well as the establishment of the Gullah Geechee Heritage Commission and the preparation of the Gullah Geechee Culture and Heritage Corridor Management Plan. Currently, Michael is working extensively on the chronicling and the interpretation of sites that tell the narrative of the Reconstruction era. So, Michael, we want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. And Michael, you may need to unmute yourself. Again, Michael, you may need to unmute yourself. Okay, as I was saying, I'd like to um, thank you, Carlton. Now you can hear me. <laughs> um, I'd like to That's say correct. I... I do. I'm sorry, can you hear me now, sir? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I'd like to say um, thank you, Carlton, to my other panelists that have, I guess, painted a picture of um, engagement, uh, civic opportunity, but also the sensitivity of community. Um, 
Yes, my name is Michael Allen. I am with the National Park Service, and I want to talk to you about making a visible difference in the Gullah Geechee community. Um, this will give you some background. Uh, the slide that you see before you now this afternoon, it highlights a map of what we call the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. It highlights an area that stretches all the way from uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, as you see in the upper right-hand corner of that map, all the way down just below Jacksonville, Florida, into St. John's County, where St. Augustine exists today, what we call today the Gullah Geechee region. If you look in the very center of that map, you notice this highlight the city of Charleston. Um, the city of Charleston, or Charlestown historically, was in many respects the major entry of Africans uh, into the New World and specifically into North America and, and to the Americas or United States. I want to use that as a reference base because our conversation will talk about how the National Park Service, communities, and organizations have worked collaboratively over the last 15 years to establish the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, the relevancy of having this corridor, and how using uh, tools involving, involving environmental justice, but also community outreach would allow you to have the geographical area that's referred to as the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor on the left side of your screen and on the right side of your screen actually seeing the logo mm -hmm. which represents this area today. Uh, a National Heritage Area is one of the many programs that are part of the National Park Service. At the present time, there are approximately uh, 49 National Heritage Areas across the United States. You notice highlighted in red uh, the geographical boundary of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. Of the other 48 National Heritage Area, uh, the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor is the only National Heritage Area in America that deals specifically with African and African American history. So I just want to make that very plain when you look at the other 48 on this map, but the one that's highlighted um, in red is the only use of African African American history. Just to give you a timeline, ironically, um, nearly a decade ago, uh, in 2006, um, the United States Congress uh, passed the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Act. The following year, uh, we pulled together approximately 25 individuals from across those four states you saw on that map earlier to form what's called a commission. And one of the central tenets of this commission was to actually conduct what's called a management plan. In the vernacular of the National Park Service, when new National Heritage Areas come online, they're required to follow the steps that you see here on the screen before you in order to develop a management plan, which is the product. And that management plan now becomes the guide it becomes the roadmap. It dictates um, how the community, along with the National Park Service, other agencies, whether they're state, local, federal, nonprofits, would work together in order to develop this management plan. So I just want to give you a framework of what we actually started uh, back in 2009 that moved us to the establishment of a management plan. The overview of how we work through this process here. As in any type plan, you have to have a coordinated company or entity that can help you pull this together. Given that the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor was a unique opportunity for the National Park Service, and, and, and my role in that was kind of serving as the, the coordinator of the commission and the, court, and the corridor, but also as a Park Service employee, how do you manage and how do you juggle both of those institutions? Um, as you heard earlier, a lot of times in minority organizations, there may be a level of suspicion that deals when the government comes in to say, we're here to help. So a, a part of, of, of my work was balancing the needs and the interests of the community, first of all, because I am of Gullah Geechee persuasion, and then also, as an employee of the National Park Service, sometimes maybe encouraging the Park Service or maybe educating the Park Service of how to actually work with uh, communities in a more sensitive manner. 
so you can see on this project outline there were some benchmarks that, that, that we wanted to develop. Uh, we did call, call upon one of the arms of the National Park Service, Denver Service Center, or DSC, to actually um, work as the entity that, that would help us pull together um, this management plan. We then began to make sure that we had the capacity to reach out to as many individuals as we possibly can across the four states. As you see, you know, we, we pulled together over 6,000 addresses so people from the community, organizations, and groups across the four states in an effort in developing a newsletter so all residents would have some sort of knowledge of, of what the organization was all about, what the planning was all about, how they could be involved, and how they could see themselves as an active participant in the success of this engagement. Um, probably the greatest challenge that we had is actually reaching out to the community. As I shared, because the, the corridor is, is of a size and scope, four states, uh, as I said, uh, stretching all the way from um, Wilmington, North Carolina, all the way down to uh, Jacksonville, Florida. So we began an ambitious journey, if you will, between February of 2009 and August of 2009 to conduct 21 public meetings across the four states. Uh, and this is probably the first time that the National Park Service or any public entity connected with the agency have conducted 21 public meetings on a single topic. And what we did strategically, we met in churches, community buildings, um, other public spaces that would be open, that would allow folks to feel connected, also feel safe and engaged to talk about the history, the legacy and culture of Gullah Geechee people. And one of the things we also was mindful of that we did not want folks to have to drive a great distance if they wanted to participate in one of these 21 public meetings. So we strategically placed them in places that any individual with in the corridor would not have to drive over 35 to 40 minutes uh, to, to attend one of the public meeting sites. The, the, the purpose of actually working these 21 meetings was to develop vision, mission, goals, and themes. And we knew that was very important because it would give us an idea of how we could move forward in preserving, protecting, and sustaining this important thread of our American experience. In addition to the public meetings, we um, had an opportunity to interface with the National Park Service GIS and database uh, division. And as you know, GIS provides a, a, a way of, of, of mapping physical sites, buildings, location, places um, as a part of a historical research document process. And so not only were we reaching out and talking with the communities, meeting with the communities, but we also were identifying sites, places, locations, buildings, baptism sites, burial sites, whatever, across the four states in an effort to give a more comprehensive look at uh, Gullah Geechee history and culture across these four states. And as you see on the bottom of the screen, uh, in October 2009, we actually gathered uh, in Denver to kind of review all the, what we had um, amassed from the course of, from February of, of 2009 all the way to August of 2009. One of the tools that we utilized um, within the National Park Service called Pepsi. And as it says, Pepsi provides us an opportunity to, to really gain public comments. We realize that in many minority communities, there may be a digital divide. And so we just didn't allow all of the comments that we received just to be received you know, electronically. But also, we provided opportunities for community organizations, churches, and entities to collect data or information from their community and send it to us the old-fashioned way by mail. That way we had more of a, a comprehensive look um, at what we had gathered, what we had gained, which would provide us more data as we were moving forward in developing this management plan. And so as we went along, we had to revise the original agreement that we had with Denver Service Center 
And in November 2009, we then began to send comments out to uh, electronic means that people can then somewhat check the box to make sure what we got was accurate, what we heard was what they actually said. And if we need to make any changes to what we may have thought they said, we had this opportunity so people could feel engaged and enriched. As you see, this public comment period, um, as I shared earlier, February of 2009 to August of 2009, 21 public meetings in 19 different locations. As I shared earlier, um, how we were able to you know, gather information and people's comments electronically and also at the public meetings that we had. And mind you, over the course of, of this time, we received over 1,500 public comments uh, about this quest, this journey that we were on. And they were not just limited to the four states of, of the National Heritage Area, but we got comments and, and comments and information from folks from other parts of the country as well. So we felt uh, gratified by that. Again, um, we, we went through the Pepsi process, this electronic database that actually highlights, you've seen this map before you, where we got comments, uh, what people said. So people could actually go online and track to, to make sure that the comments that we had was accurately, accurately tracked from where it came from and also accurately, accurately tracked and what the individual said. And, and so that was a way, for, again, for people to feel connected, to feel engaged, but also to feel part of this process. Um, one of the things I, I, I share and from this slide here is that there was a lot of devotion that was given and a lot of attention that was given to this process. I failed to mention that um, in 2006 when the commission, when the corridor was formed and we formed the commission uh, in 2007, there was approximately 25 members of that commission from across the four states. Uh, many of these individuals may not have ever met each other before, and so a part of my task was finding a creative way that we could engage these 25 individuals, not to work as 25 individuals, but to work as one body. And so a, a part of my task was dealing from a cultural perspective, how do you engage communities from four different states, you know, uh, area the size of Maryland, that they would feel connected enough that they could work as one unit and not work as 25 individual um, process. So as a result of the 21 public meetings and all the comments and, and the back and forth that we uh, had to go internally and externally, we were able to develop a vision and mission. And so you can see for yourself, you know, the vision was an environment that celebrates the legacy and the continuing contributions of Gullah Geechee people to our American heritage. And out of that, we develop a, a mission uh, to nurture pride and to facilitate an understanding and awareness of the significance of Gullah Geechee history and culture within the Gullah Geechee community. And if I can, I would like to say it's important that we use to, what you see here to nurture pride. Um, we learned very early in this process that many folks of the Gullah Geechee history, culture, persuasion, did not often see themselves in a prideful or, or in a very positive manner because for centuries and for years, uh, individuals who were of Gullah Geechee history and culture were, were, were I guess, made to feel ashamed of themselves and, and not having pride in their history, their background, their legacy, and their contributions. And so we knew that one of our missions was to bring that pride to the community. Secondly, to sustain and preserve land and language and cultural assets. And I want to stop with the word preserve land. I don't know if many of you all have visited the Sea Islands or the, the coastal line areas of uh, North Carolina and South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. It's ever evolving. And that evolution that's happening there a lot of times is taking place at the expense of those who have been there historically over the last three centuries. And so without preserving the land or the language, then there's no Gullah Geechee history or culture. So one of the central tenets that we realize as a mission is that there got to be creative ways to sustain and preserve the land and the language. Uh, the last uh, mission statement is to educate the public on the value and we felt that was important. We know that's important, and you can relate to that, because if people don't put value on, your, on, on who you are, 
uh, your, your values, your history, your culture, your, your legacy, then they are subject a lot of times to dismiss the importance of it and move to eradicate it. And so in listening to the communities that we involve and connected with and the people that we talk with, we knew it was important that around the nation, so it's not only in the four, four states of the corridor, understand the importance and history of Gullah Geechee culture. And so out of that, we develop goals and strategies, as you can see there, um, in protecting and preserving, restoring tangible and intangible um, assets, um, enhancing the quality of life, not only for the present, but for the future, and then a foster of public awareness and appreciation for the history of Gullah Geechee people. I think that's important. Um, history tells us that, as we talk about Charleston as a major importation site, uh, nearly 40% of all African enslaved individuals that survived the Middle Passage that, that came across the Atlantic that arrived in, in North America did that in, in Charleston. And today, nearly 60 to 70% of African Americans across the country can potentially trace their lineage um, through the Port of Charleston. But without fostering a public awareness of this or appreciation for this, then this falls on deaf ear. And so the Gullah Geechee community and the people knew their place and understood their place in the building of America. And that's why they felt it was important that we foster public awareness of their part of our American experience. Then we uh, looked at interpretive themes. How can this be utilized at interpretive sites, uh, plantation sites, museums, educational opportunities that not only will people see and understand it, but they can also respect it. And so as you see here, uh, these are some of the interpretive themes that, that came out of, of our journey and our quest uh, with the Gullah community and people. Mike, we have approximately three minutes. Okay. Um, there were a couple things that, that I wanted to put in play that was very important. One, as I shared, uh, the boundaries of the Heritage Corridor um, which stretches from Wilmington, North Carolina, all the way down initially to Jacksonville, Florida, and eventually it was included, um, expanded to include uh, St. Augustine, Florida. Um, secondly, we wanted to have coastal heritage centers or, or visitor centers that they're working on now that would be placed across the four states. And as you share and see here, there was a local entity, which is the commission, that was pulled together to manage all these activities here. And so you can see that we, by 2010, uh, form up, finalized the process of, um, of, of how we want to move forward. Uh, we began drafting the management plan in 2010 based on the themes and the sub-themes you saw earlier. And again, this is kind of re recapping how we wanted to move forward. And you can see that we, we, we try to, to keep, this, keep the public involved, keep them engaged in, in all the turns of, of this activity here. And this just shows the outreach in terms of the economics uh, that the National Park Service invested in order to, to allow this to come to pass. What I want to end by saying is today exists the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. Uh, it's a public engagement process that used many of the tools that the my panelists shared earlier, that civic pride, civic engagement, and most especially um, having people feel connected. If you go to the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor website today, uh, gullahgeecheecorridor.org, you will be able to see an um, electronic copy of the, the management plan. And if you flip through that management plan, uh, you will see clearly that we highlighted in that management plan um, quotes from um, participants at our 21 public meetings. And we did that because we wanted people to feel connected to the end product. And so that's, that's one of the um, outcomes of this journey. Secondly, as I refer back to this map here again, uh, starting up uh, where the point is in Wilmington, North Carolina, all the way down to St. John's County. If you happen to travel Highway 17 today, along the corridor spine, if you will. We've developed a highway sign that's, uh, that you can see as you enter into every county across the four states. 
that's another way of people being linked together, not as a separate entity, but as one unit. And so that, that's another way that, that we have been able to utilize the, the working of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. Uh, two other closing points. I, I'm pointing um, to point to now where it says uh, Georgetown County. And I, I wanted to put it in Georgetown County because here's a little known fact that you all may or may not know that the lineage of the First Lady, Michelle Obama, um, is from Georgetown County. Just below the, uh, the main, the county seat of Georgetown is a plantation by the name of Friendfield, in which her father's folks were enslaved. Um, that plantation still exists today. Um, the First Lady has visited that, that site, and so how many Americans knew that the, Gullah, that the First Lady of our nation was of Gullah Geechee persuasion, and that she um, now knows, and the nation knows, that uh, that's a part of her lineage. And so that's the power of what we've been involved with um, in establishing and working with the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. And I want to end on this note as I point back toward Charleston in closing. It was in Charleston, South Carolina, on May 9th, in the basement of Mother Emanuel, that the first public meeting was held that I helped to organize, having a conversation and potentially establishing the Gullah Geechee Culture Heritage Corridor. So high ironic in a very place that now we know as a tragic part of our American experience, the basement of Mother Emanuel in Charleston, South Carolina, where nine souls were lost, was the beginning of this conversation to preserve, to protect, and make a visible difference in the Gullah Geechee Culture Heritage Corridor community today. And so I just want to thank you all for the opportunity um, Carlton to, to be able to share this with you today in working to establish a heritage area, a management plan, but also to preserve an important part of our American experience. Thank you, Michael, uh, for taking the time to present. And again, I want to thank all of our discussants, uh, Chancey Martorell, Tracy Strum uh, Gilliam, uh, and Michael Allen, uh, who is with the National Park Service. Uh, we've now reached the question and answer portion of our segment. Uh, it is 2.19, so we have approximately 11 minutes for question and answers. Uh, Christine Dursey is going to lead the question and answer portion uh, of our webinar today. And the only housekeeping item that I need to acknowledge is that we invite you to be a part of the Equitable Development Webinar Series again on Friday, December 16. Uh, the third webinar in our series will focus on faith-based development, neighborhood anchors as community builders. So thank you, Michael, for uh, loading the question and answer slide that has the contact information for all of our presenters. I will now turn it back over to Christine Dursey. Okay, thanks, Carlton. And also another housekeeping item. I've had a few folks come in and, and type some questions. Uh, this session is being recorded, and again, you can view it afterwards on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast uh, on YouTube. And also, we will have a PDF of the presentation available for download uh, on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Okay, let's jump in real quick and see how many of these questions we can get answered. Uh, first one is for Chansey. Uh, could could you talk about whether or not there were any other Asian interests uh, besides Thai uh, in, in your area? Um, specifically, I'm assuming the neighborhood is East Hollywood. Um, the predominant Asian community in East Hollywood uh, is, is Thai, uh, but we also work uh, with Filipinos uh, nearby in, in the area as well, and with Koreans, because we're adjacent to Koreatown. So, um, yes, we work very closely with, with all the other uh, ethnic Asian communities in fact, we're part of the Asian Pacific Islander Small Business Program, and um, the nonprofit organizations of each of these communities are, are part of that consortium that delivers one-on-one uh, -on -one business counseling to our respective uh, ethnic community businesses and technical assistance. So that includes the Korea Town Youth Community Center, First Student Buffalo you know, American, Chinatown Service Center, which is actually further out near downtown in Chinatown, and also local social service center, Community Development. 
uh, we uh, partner with a lot of other API uh, communities. Uh, we co-founded a national coalition of agencies, uh, Americans for Community Development, based in Washington, D.C., which um, is a member organization of um, hundreds of API community development that does corporate or Okay, thank you. Uh, next up, a uh, question for Tracy. Could um, could you talk a little bit uh, about some public engagement best best practices that uh, you've come upon in your work? Oh, absolutely. Um, let's start with grassroots outreach and engagement first, because that's a personal favorite of mine. Um, I advocate for uh, holistic programs that include grassroots outreach um, engagement, whether it is uh, chat and choose in the community, lemonade stands, um, working um, and providing information door-to-door. Uh, -to -door. I love doing um, also mixed with a little bit of interview techniques. It's really great. Um, barber shops, washing, um, washitarias, I guess is what they call them. Um, or uh, Those are all great tools too. Transit outreach is another good one. So a lot of people will do work at transit centers, so they may do a bus back or they'll purchase um, a placard on inside the bus but may not actually go out and set up a booth or station or do actual outreach in transit centers. That's really great for low income and minority communities. I like community events, so they're wonderful. And then from a larger perspective, so like the higher level, if you have budgets, um, innovative meeting techniques such as uh, any type of crowdsourcing, um, virtual meetings, um, making sure that you have proper branding and, and engagement, um, larger community events, ribbon cuttings, um, bikes, uh, bike loops, you know, on a bridge before they open, that type of work. So there, there can be a mix. And what I pride myself on is um, I can develop a public involvement plan in any budget, and you should be able to. So if you have more money, then you can do some things that are more creative. And then if you don't, you still need to be creative, but you need to be creative to work within those budget constraints. I hope that answered the question. That was great. Thank you. Uh, Michael, this one is for you. Will uh, your efforts connect with the Smithsonian Museum for African Americans that just recently opened in Washington, D.C. Great, thank you. Um, ironically, there are a number of pieces of, of historical artifact. Actually, it's a slave cabin that was taken from Edisto Island that's now part of the National African American Museum. Uh, there's a back door of a bus from a civil rights worker from Johns Island, South Carolina, that's um, a part of the Smithsonian Museum. There are a number of other cultural pieces, sweet grass baskets that I know personally that are a part of the museum. So the answer to that question is yes. Gullah Geechee history and culture will be a part um, of, of the new National African American Museum. Um, in fact, some of the employees that are there now in D.C., I've worked with them when they lived here in the Low Country. So yes, um, it will be well represented um, in that new facility. In fact, I'm looking forward to seeing that facility at the end of the month. Great. Thank you. Uh, Chansey, this one's for you. Could you talk a little bit about um, how the city of Los Angeles was involved in the process to date? Um, <clears throat> I think the question specifically pertains to the designation of Titan process, um, if, if, if I'm correct. Uh, the city of LA, yes, we um, had to engage the city. We initially engaged the, um, the council person representing the area back in 1992. And um, 
and we put forth as a result of our needs assessment uh, and findings uh, that not only demonstrated the extent of the needs and issues in the Thai community and the overall need for resources and investments and, and also a creation of, of a community um, center and organization, but also um, demonstrated the uh, need for a designation of Thai town. So we submitted our, our findings in the form of a vision statement from the Thai community and a proposal that listed out all the issues that the Thai town designation could address in terms of improving the local economy and um, revitalizing the area and, and growing uh, the local businesses and using cultural tourism as a vehicle for economic development and all that. And so that was presented to the council person. But then as it was proceeding in 94 then, um, this, this was 92, in 94 we were struck by a Northridge earthquake, yet another disaster that had adverse impact on our community. And we had to respond to that and did a lot of emergency relief. The Titan designation campaign then didn't get resurrected until 98 at which point we then um, had a new council person in office and uh, we then worked uh, with her office, this council person, and, and the strategy around our campaign changed to really demonstrate to her the broad, broad impact, broad-based um, impact that Thai Town Nation would have and also the broad-based support it would have from the other uh, multi-ethnic community members in the area. And so there, therefore we began the, the whole uh, civic engagement process of our Thai Town Formation community members being trained in collecting petitions and signatures, sending postcards to, getting postcards sent to council office and getting support letters sent to council office. And once we demonstrated that broad-based support, we were able um, to get a motion introduced in city council and get it unanimously passed um, in 1999. Thanks. All right, Tracy, a couple questions are coming in um, regarding the governor canceling the uh, the red line project. Could you talk a little bit about how communities responded to that and if there was any political or advocacy based responses um, that were either positive or negative after the cancellation? Um, yes, so there was on, on both parts. So from a community perspective, um, one of the things I, I should tell you is of course with any project, not everyone agrees with the project, right? So we did have a, a sector of the community that wasn't sure that the red line was the best thing. What was interesting is when the project was canceled, those folks came out of the woodwork and said, so we don't get anything. So what was very interesting was that sometimes even the folks that may be fighting you along the way to make sure that they get what they want out of a project still feel like something is better than nothing. And so there was a lot of disappointment. There was um, some um, significant community mobilization. Um, there were a couple of uh, protests. Um, the, the mayor of Baltimore had a coalition down in Annapolis um, meeting with the governor they came up here. Um, there is a web, Red Line Now support group that um, also wrote letters and there was a, a letter writing campaign by several of the um, local transit organizations as well as the community. It didn't result in a reversal of the governor's decision. Um, but I think what it did serve to do was um, to let people know that um, that in in person work, that coalition building, um, you know, really banding together and making sure that public involvement is sincere and transparent, really serve the long term um, good versus just being for one specific project. So those relationships are still there. Okay, thank you. Um, that brings us to 2.30, which means we need to close up shop. Um, thank you to Carlton for gathering our panelists together, and thank you 
Chansey and Tracy and, and Michael for joining us today. And of course, the Planning in the Black Community Division for sponsoring today's webcast. Uh, again, visit ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast for a PDF of the presentation, which will be up later this afternoon. And head over to YouTube and just search planning webcast uh, to get a recording of this session, which will also be up later this afternoon. Again, thanks to everyone, and we will talk next time.